Heavenly Father, as we take up this afternoon study, we ask for a blessing upon our time. We ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit and that you might empower this message, that it might bring light um, to the brothers and sisters, no matter where they might be, uh, considering this message. Uh, we want the latter rain to be poured out upon us at this time in fulfillment of Zechariah's command. We ask for that to take place. Please bless us with words from on high. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a recap of the last presentation I did. Um, Theodore sent in a correction. Um, I had Can you unmute the audio, please. Unmute the audio, please. Okay. Larry's just getting there to unmute the audio. And he can tell me when I'm ready to go. All right. So, page one of your notes. Um, if I can do it, I'm going to recap the last presentation and give an overview of where we're going from here on out. I'm going to get out of the chronology. I've been trying to take these chronological revelations that primarily come from Theodore and Odilio and um, Stephen um, and put them in, a, in a, a simplified version perhaps. But one of the mistakes that I made in the last presentation, Theodore uh, proof checks me. You can see under another correction, it says that tw June 27th, 1844 is the day that S Snow's June 22nd letter was published. And I was pointing to June 22nd as a, a symbol in our history. I'm still upholding that. But in Samuel Snow's line, he had written a letter that gets published in his line. You have to look at Samuel Snow's line to follow my logic. We're not going to do that. And he wrote that letter on June 22nd, which in that history was Pentecost, and the letter got published in June 27th. So there's a, there's a connection between the two, and I stated it incorrectly. And this is Theodore's word, his expression in the, in the notes. It was the Gordian knot, and I'm not so certain that I can give the definition of the Gordian knot, um, but I remember when it's been explained by Theodore and Odilio. This is the way mark in Samuel Snow's history where you have June 20, you have two way marks and you have to bring them together. And Odilio doesn't call it the Gordian knot, Theodore does. But what I mean by that, June 22nd in Samuel Snow's history is the sixth day of the third month and June 27th, when that letter that was written on June 22nd, June 27th, the letter was published. And June 27th was the 11th day of the third month. So if you take, the, take June 27th at the 11th day of the third month and you double it, it becomes the 22nd day of the sixth month, which is June 22nd. So by doubling the biblical symbol of June 27th, it gives you the same numerical value as June 22nd. Okay. You have to work through that one on your own. June 22nd is an established way. Mark, it was Pentecost. Because I, it was Midnight Cry? It, it, Samuel is Snow's history like is doubling? all Midnight Cry. If there's ever, ever a justification for looking for doubling. But I, I don't want to belabor that. I don't want... You need to save some of your brain power because we're going to walk through a couple things here at the beginning that isn't review. And it, I don't want you to get thrown. The, the next two paragraphs from Early Writings, page 38, is familiar ground. We've, we've referenced this more than once in this study. This is where we see Jesus saying, hold, 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 hold four times. Okay? And so that hold, 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 hold becomes a point of prophetic reference. We put the four holds at 9-11. At July 18th and at December 25th, 2021. Then there's another hold that comes after December 25th, and we've identified that that fourth hold, and he's holding the winds of strife so that the ceiling can go on, and that fourth hold does not take place in the history of the United States. 
The, at the third hold on December 25th, 2021, the United States falls with Balaam. That's the end of the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. Now the seventh kingdom is in place, and Islam still has a, a strike to make. There'll be a hold placed on it at the beginning of that history. And so we've been dealing with that. And you can see another familiar quote from Early Writings, page 78, um, that... 38. Uh, page 85. I've just referenced 38. I'm on the bottom of the page now, the last two paragraphs there, where Sister White's talking about the angering of the nations. And I'm going to cut down to the middle of the second paragraph from Early Writings 85, the last paragraph on page one of your notes. It says, At that time... While the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth, and the nations will be angry yet held in check. And we place that at 9-11. 9-11, the east wind strikes the ships of Tarshish, brings an economic crisis to the United States. But Bush immediately puts a check upon Islam. So the nations are angry yet held in check. So as not to prevent the work of the third angel, the work of the third angel at this point is the sealing of the 144,000. Because the hold, 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 the holding of the four winds in Revelation 7 is marking the sealing time of the 144,000. Okay, so at that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth and the nations will be angry yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. And at that very same time, she says, and at that time, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come. And, and this is one of the many arguments we use to place the sprinkling of the latter rain beginning at 9-11. What I want you to see, if you will, is that the, there's some distinctions in these four way marks of hold, 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 hold. Um, this, is, this is a hold here that we've identified as 9-11, the third hour in the parable of the vineyard workers, if that's the way to call it. We identify this as 9-11. We identify the sixth hour as July 18th, the ninth hour as December 25th, and here there's another hold that's going to come after the Sunday Law, but it's not during the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy because that kingdom has fallen right here. Because this is the first strike of Balaam striking the ass. This is where Balaam strikes the ass a second time. And this is where he strikes it the third time. But the ass and Balaam both go down here. Okay, Islam isn't finished any more than the United States is finished. The United States is going to become part of the United Nations, but this is the end of the Sixth Kingdom of Bible Prophecy. So there's a hold that takes place here. There's four holds. Everyone with me? This is review. This is review by and large. So now I want to take you to uh, page two of your notes, and if you would, uh, go to Second Kings. Second Kings chapter one, and I, I think I might have left out a one in there in the a typo. Second Kings chapter one, verse. What chapter? I'm in the first book of Kings. That's my problem. Hey, give, give me a second. Second Kings, chapter one, verse one. That's where we're going to start. Okay, I, 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 right now, I'm not remembering exactly why I have that 1 slash 21. I can't explain it to you. Maybe it will come to me. Uh, maybe we're supposed to go all the way to verse 21, but there's not 21 verses in that chapter, so I don't think that's it, okay? So what I want to do before we read through it is I just want to give you some meanings of, of 
places and people that are mentioned in the chapter in your notes where it says 2 Kings 1.21 on page 2, 2 Second Kings chapter 1, verse 1. I'm saying maybe you never Maybe I what? Maybe you wanted chapter 21. No, I'm, I'm in the right chapter. I'm in 2 Kings 1. Yes. Um, there are there's certain symbols in here that I want to put in place before we read through it. Ahaziah, Ahaziah who's, a, who's going to be mentioned in this passage, it means God has seized. Okay, God's going to deal with this king. Seized. I just seized this desk. Seized. Yes, grabbed. You follow that? Okay. Um, Samaria means watch station. Okay, watchtower. And that's where the watchman's supposed to be. Elijah means strength of God. What's the strength of God? You might say it's the word of God, but in the story of Elijah, it's probably the power of God as manifested in his judgments. Okay, so Elijah means strength of God. And uh, Tishbite means recourse. Okay, Elijah the Tishbite... Uh, it's like what Daniel was referring to today, that as, as this rebellion reaches the, the time period of the French Revolution, or as this re rebellion's reaching our time period, God has no other recourse but to bring judgments. Okay, now he's going to speak through judgments. And Elijah is a symbol of his representatives that proclaim the power of God, the judgment of God. That's the only recourse that's left for the Lord. He's Elijah the Tishbite. Uh, and Belzebub, Bel means master, lord, or husband. And Zebub means fly. He's the lord of the flies. And when you think of that, you think about an annoying fly, but actually this fly is some kind of fly that can sting. It's, you know, more in terms of a wasp or some aggressive fly. There's like a horse fly around here. The horse flies around here, they can bite you and draw blood. So it's not just an annoying fly, it's more than that. And that's what Beelzebub is. Um, and it's a god of Ekron. And Ekron means pluck up or exterminate. Okay, because in this history you're going to see a nation plucked up and exterminated. So if you go to 1 Kings chapter 1, those are the players there. And we'll read down through this. Second Kings chapter 1, keep me straight. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Okay, and I want to remind you of our study of the presidents. The presidents of the, the Republican presidents of the United States and the presidents of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In that regard, there were kings of Israel and Judah. Who was Judah representing? The presidents of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Who were the presidents of the United States represented by? Israel, the Republican presidents. There were 19 kings in, in Israel, the 10 northern tribes. There were 20 in Judah. There's been 20 general conference presidents, and since 1863 there have been 19, well, since their very beginning, the first Republican president, 1863, Abraham Lincoln. Okay. Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. So this is about Israel. So I'm going to say this is about the United States. And Ahazia, Ahazia, has someone know how to pronounce that correctly? Ahazia. Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria. He was in the watchtower and was sick. And he sent messengers and said, Go unto them, go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. So he's not trusting in God. He's reaching out to a god from Ekron. And Ekron means plucked up. Okay, his kingdom's about to be plucked up. I'm suggesting that this is the kingdom of the United States. This is a king of Israel. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, the Tishbite, I have no other recourse now, 
but to bring judgments. He says, But the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is not... Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. So the king's sick. He thinks he might die. He sends his messenger to spiritualism to find out if he can buy some time, if he's going to die or not. And before they get to Beelzebub, Elijah intercepts him and says, go back and tell the king he's not getting out of his bed, he's going to die. You follow the story? And verse 5, And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are you now turned back? When they turned back to the king. And they said unto him, There came a man up to meet us, and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they said, they answered him, He was a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. The king knew who it was, just by the description. Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty. And he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of the hill. Elijah is setting up on the top of a hill. When does Elijah get set on top of a hill? Oh, on Mount Carmel. A, a nice guess, but that's not the guess I'm looking for. When does Elijah get set on top of a hill? When does Jerusalem getting lifted up above all the other mountains happen? July 18th. July 18th. It's being lifted up as an ensign. That's where Elijah's setting now. He's setting on top of a hill, right? Okay, uh, perhaps. You'll have to test it out for yourself. Um, okay, and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king has said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came f down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Whoa. Again, the king, again also he sent unto him another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. That's kind of a doubling. Same pronouncement, same event. There's a doubling right there where the ensign is lifted up above the mountains. It's the hill. And Elijah's setting on it. And he, the king, and he sent him, sent again a captain of the of the third fifty and with his fifty, and the third captain of the fifty went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty of thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came fire down from heaven and burn up the two captains in the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore, let my life be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and he went down with him unto the king. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Forasmuch as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it not because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. So he died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. And Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because he had no son. Now, what I want, what I want to say here... Two times it says, let my life now be precious in thy sight. There's a doubling. I'm saying that Elijah is here on the hill as an ensign on July 18th. And over here at 9-11, there's been a hold. But Elijah is not, nobody knows who Elijah is. He's hidden. He's hidden till here. 
Okay, Elijah comes out into the open here because he's made a prediction about fire coming down out of heaven. It's about the message he gave. It, and it's, he's also over here, there's going to be fire that comes down out of heaven. And this we're understanding is the Sunday law. And what I'm saying is illustrated here is this message. What message? The message now that Elijah, when he's put on the hill, is giving not only to the Levites, but to the world. Why do I say that? Okay, fire came down, is going to come down here, right? And fire is going to come down here. And it could have come down here immediately after the Sunday law, but this third guy, he's smart enough to figure out on two witnesses, I don't want to be rebellious with this prophet. Okay, this guy here is an 11th hour worker. He has seen what has went on in this history with these two manifestations of the power of God. And this is about the message that this movement proclaim, proclaims from July 18th onward. Why am I saying it's about the message? What's the symbol of the message? 51, 51, 51 equals 153. If you remember what we looked at on 153. All I remember is the fishes. It's the same thing as 1533. The same thing as 1533, but it's about the message. This is where Elijah now is being recognized outside of this movement and in the world. And it has to do with the four holds. He's not recognized here. He's hidden. He's recognized. He's recognized. Now the Nethanims are responding to him. You see it? Mm -hmm. And that's the fourth hold as well. That's, th that's something that Stephen dug out. Okay. Now, over here, walk you through this very quickly. In, on page 2, it says Matthew 20, 1 through 16, the, the parable of the, the workers in the vineyard. They got morning, the third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, eleventh hour. That's this here, third, sixth, ninth, eleventh hour. And uh, you know that in some places in the scriptures that the Lord will use um, squaring of numbers. Okay, the, I, I, there's two witnesses in here, and numbers squared occur in the Jubilee. A Jubilee takes place after seven cycles of seven years. What's, what's the squaring of a number? It's multiplying the number by itself. Seven times seven is squaring seven. Okay, so the, we see that the Bible uses the principle of squaring. The Jubilee, the Feast of Weeks, it, even Jesus does it with a little variation when he's asked, how many times shall I forgive my brother? What does Jesus Seven times seventy. Not quite squaring. And that's the same thing as in Revelation 7 with the 144,000. Right? Twelve. How many in each tribe? Twelve times twelve thousand. 144,000. Okay, so the Bible uses squaring. But where do we see the holding of the four winds? We see it in Revelation 7. Okay, so what I'm saying is, in Revelation 7, we have the holds. Hold, 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 hold. But in Revelation 7, we also have the squaring. And Revelation 7 can be brought into the hours of the vineyard working. Now you have this in your notes, so I won't demand that you look up here, but you need to follow this. This is the third hour. Okay. If we square the third hour, 3 times 3 equals 9. It's okay to square stuff in the Bible. God does it. It's okay to do what God does. Palmoni squares things. The sixth hour is 6 times 6 is 36. The ninth hour is 9 times 9 is 81. If you take these totals, 9, 36, 81, and add them together, they come to 126. Okay, but if you now take these numbers, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, and add them, three, six, nine, 
they add up to 18, and if you add the 126 and the 18 together, it comes to 144. There's Revelation 7 for you. There's Peter for you. There's Revelation 14.4 for you. So, if now, that's just the third, sixth, and ninth hour. If you take the eleventh hour, and eleven times eleven is one twenty-one, yes. Amen. And up here you have one twenty-six from three six nine. If you add one twenty-six and one twenty-one, it comes to two forty-seven. And then if you add these three six nine and eleven, three six nine eleven, it comes to twenty-nine. And two forty-seven and twenty-nine is two seventy-six. And what is 276? It's a reference to Acts and the priest and the Levites. Three of them were priests, 273 are Levites. So that being said, there's one other thing you can do. If you take the 3rd, 6th, ninth, 11th, and 12th hour, because in the 12th hour the winds are fully released when human probation closes, they add up to 41. And if you take the, the amount that is created when you square it, 9, 36, 81, 121, and 144, and you add them together, you get 391. You with me? So this way, you're getting 41 and 391, and this is Ezekiel's Josiah prophecy. Ezekiel gives a prophecy that begins in 977, and, the, and Israel's given 390 years of probationary time. And he laying on one side, and then he lays on his other side for 40 days because Judah's given 40 years of probationary time. But Ezekiel's prophecy is predicting two things. It's predicting when the siege comes in 586, and when Jerusalem is destroyed, still in 586, just the way it laid out historically. So there's actually a year here between the siege and the destruction of Jerusalem in the temple. So the actual numbers of Ezekiel's Josiah prophecy are 391 and 41, which is derived from the hours in the vineyard and by the squaring of the numbers that we get from the scriptures, particularly with what we're looking at in Revelation 7. Uh, there. Yeah. The 391 and the 41, wouldn't that be connected to Ezekiel 4? That's what I'm talking about. Because you have, although in Ezekiel 4 you have 390 and 40, and I, I've forgotten why, there, why the one is not there. It's, I just told you, and you, di and you didn't follow me, my bad, but that's, I just told you. His prophecy, this first way mark here where the arrow ends at 586, yeah. at 586, that's when the siege comes. Okay. And it, the next way mark is where Jerusalem's destroyed. Okay. And the 390 and the 40 ends at the siege, but there's still another year to the destruction. So Ezekiel's, Ezekiel is identifying two conclusions, both the siege and the destruction of Jerusalem. And when you take the destruction of Jerusalem into account, then it's 391 and 41. That's what that adds up to. Don't think it's a coincidence. Okay, so I may have... I... I I thought maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't in terms of throwing this in in the afternoon before we go back to where we were going to review that maybe it was a bad idea. We will see. If I've already burned up any brain cells that you had left from this morning, then it was bad. If not, follow along. We're going to go back to the chiasms that we were trying to lay out. Um, the last presentation I did. This is, this is what I'm calling the midnight chiasm up here. You have it in your notes, an illustration of it. Um, and oh, that was what I was looking for, Larry. I just found it. Um, Larry and I, before we got started, I was looking for, I was looking for, I was looking for, I couldn't find it. It's up here. I'll get to it in a moment. I'm saying that this chiasm here, this chiastic structure, is speaking about the Lord opening up the message to this movement in our history. And that 
on September 7th, um, we began, 9 times 7, we began a 63-day 63 63-day period that takes us to November 9th, and then another 63-day period takes us to January 11th. I'm using the center of any chiasm as the primary marker of the theme, okay? The center of this mid, this is, the reason I have this here is this is the title I'm putting on it. This is the midnight chiasm. Ezekiel 1.1 1, 1 is the simplest one for me. This identifies the point in time where the Lord opens the view into the most holy place for God's people. So this is the opening up of the message for God's people here at the end of time. So if that's the center point here, then back here would ha have to be something to do with the message, and over here would have to be something to do with the message, because the chiasm is going to have the same theme from beginning to end. Of course here, this is where we went down into the enemy's camp, and the dream and the interpretation was opened up, and from this point on, Daniel's last vision has been opened up. Okay, the, the problem now is trying to have the time and the energy to lay out everything that's been opened up. 63, 63 weeks later takes us to March 27th, 2021. And March 27th, 2021 is the end of another chiasm here. And this is the chiasm that I'm calling the Levitical The Levitical chiasm. The chiasm for the message to Adventism. I'll explain that more in a moment. All I want us to see now here is at midnight, and this midnight is this whole period of time that the Lord has opened up the message to His people. And one of the secondary proofs of this is when you use the English calendar, the American calendar, of 9-7, 11-9, uh, and 111, and you add those numbers together, they come to 327, which is a symbol of this Levitical chiasm. 327, March 27th, is 327. But if you reverse it to the European calendar, 97 reverse to 79, 119 reverse to 911, 111 is the same, and add those together, you come to 111 using the European calendar, 111 is January 11th. So this chiastic structure is teaching us about when the Lord opened the sanctuary to Ezekiel, Daniel, and John to us at the end of the world. Here's when in this history, and here is the message that he opened to us. The message is for the next group of people, for the Levites. Okay, and the Levites' chiastic structure that we've recognized is right here. Okay, this 63 weeks takes us to the end of this chiasm. This chiasm is bookend by 1533, which we understand to be a symbol of the glorious manifestation of the power of God. Okay, November 9th, 1989, the beginning of this movement. 1,533 weeks takes you to the first March 27th in this chiastic structure. January 14th, 2017 is the first time that Paneum as a, as a specific subject has been opened up. Please notice this. I'm going to add something up here that I want you to, if I can pull it off, I'll, I'll try to remember this. 21 days before this, for the first time, Rafi and Paneum was preached in Holland, a place called Bant Holland, on December 24th, 2016. Rafi and Paneum was opened up the week before on 12-17, that's a 4, uh, 2016. So what I want you to see, I'm going to put Raphia here. It's Raphia and Paneum, but just because of time. What I want you to see here, and please don't lose your way on this, is there's a phenomenon here of 7 and 21. Okay, this, this 
721 is going to be illustrated again in this line. All right, so what's happening here? Is the Lord has just removed his hand from a foundational understanding in Daniel 11. We thought the king of the south was the Soviet Union, but it was Russia. Within one week, we're teaching about this with the emphasis on the Lord removing his hand. And within three weeks, we're teaching about Paneum. Okay, Paneum is the punchline of Raphia and Paneum. Paneum is where, where it all takes place. And from here, this takes you... 1,533 days to the end of this chiastic structure that is speaking to Adventism, to the Levites. Okay, this chiastic structure, 327, 327, 327, the center of this chiastic structure was this recent March 27th, and what happened at that point in time? A hundred days of prayer instituted by the Seventh-day Adventist Church in response to this pandemic and this economic crisis. Okay, so as we approach the time, July 18th, when the Lord's going to call people out of Adventism to come into this movement, the Lord, through His providence, has put them in the position where they're seeking the Lord in a hundred days of prayer, in a crisis, a crisis that is confronting the world like no other crisis has ever con confronted the world. Okay, so there's a logic there to his providential leading if you can see it, or are willing to see it. Okay, um, so let me show you one thing over here. We're probably going to return to both of these, but we want to spend time down here also. Okay, this is the chiastic structure that I'm calling the chiastic structure of the Omega. Okay, begins on October 13th, 2018. And the center of it is 327, 2019. And the end of it is September 7th, 2019. 164 and a half days to the center point of this chiasm. I want you to note that on this side of that chiasm, you have a 63-day, 63-day chiasm. And on this side, you have a 63-day, 63-day chiasm. Okay, so you've got a chiasm at the beginning, a chiasm at the end. All right, this chiasm begins at the Italian camp meeting on June 9th, on the Sabbath miracle where, where we close at 9-11, or open at 9-11. But in any case, what's 9-11 about? Islam. The center of this chiasm is August 11th. What's August 11th a symbol of? Symbol of? Islam. October 13th, 2018 is where Theodore gives the second witness to, the Lord uses Theodore to identify the second witness to November 9th. And he does so with the 391 and a half symbol. And the 391 and a half symbol is a symbol of Islam. So this entire chiasm here is Islam. It comes from the book of Revelation. Islam. It's the tidings out of the east. Whereas this chiasm over here, that's at the end of this chiasm, this 63 and 63 day chiastic structure of 126 days, the center of it is November 9th. This is the the midnight chiasm. And here, the Lord's opening up the sanctuary. Okay, and where do we get the sanctuary message from? Daniel 8, 14. He's opening up the sanctuary. Here, he takes us down to hear a message from Daniel. Uh, this is a message about Rome, because here, on 9-7, is where he begins to open up the distinction between this movement and the Omega movement. And the Omega movement is the Jesuit movement that comes in and tries to turn this message upside down. So this chiasm of 63-63 is from Daniel. It's the tidings of the north. And this chiastic structure is from Revelation. And it's Islam, Revelation 9, Ezekiel 4, tidings of the east. So this particular chiasm is bordered by chiasms, okay? Now, 
I want, to, I want to return here. I've just given you an overview of some things. Here, from August 11th, 1840, to here is 1,533 days, which is pretty well established now in this movement as a symbol of the power of God. Okay? But if you break that history up, it can be broken up into 1260, followed by 273. Okay, what is it, what's the number 273 a symbol of? Levi. Why? Levi. Because of Acts 27? No. It's in Acts 27, but what else? Second Chronicles? Yeah. Oh, I don't know about Second Chronicles right now, but what is 273? Oh, uh, it's European for 327, isn't it? It's, it's the European expression of March 27th. Okay, so this, this is Levites. Okay, 273. For, for lots of witnesses, I'm just making sure that we, we're getting our symbols. This is the power of God manifested. And where this 1260 ends in 1844 is on January 11th in the Julian calendar. What's January 11th? That's right there. Okay. J January 11th is right there. And uh, what's 63 and 63? Okay, so please notice 126 from over here takes you to here. Okay. Now, that's Millerite history. Yes? Yes. Yeah. This is our history. From January 14th, what's January 14th? It's the first time that Paneum was presented publicly with pan, pandemic, panic. And if you go 1260 days into the future, where does it take you to? It takes you to June 27th, which is a symbol of June. 22nd. And what's June 22nd? It's Pentecost in Millerite history. Okay, you with me? So here we have a Pentecost. Here we have a message given. Was there a message given at Pentecost? Yes. Okay, and then we have 273 days that takes us to here. What's here? This is the conclusion of the message or of the chiastic structure to the Levites. Okay. Yes. Remind me why uh, June 27th is a symbol for June 22nd. Okay. It's uh, the very first thing on these notes. Okay. And the thing is, is in the, the, in the line of Samuel Snow, he wrote a letter on June 22nd, which was Pentecost in 1844. But it wasn't published until June 27th. And this was the Gordian Knot. Because in this line of Samuel Snow, you had 622 and 627. If you think back, when Odilio was presenting, he went through a lot of hoops to try to justify moving these two waymarks together. Do you remember that? He brought them together into one waymark. And Theodore does the same thing, but he calls it the Gordian Knot. Okay? And what the way Theodore does it, because this is Samuel Snow's Midnight Cry Message. Midnight Cry Message has a times two. Theodore says, teaches, that June 27th was the 11th day of the third month, and that June 22nd was the sixth day of the third month. And if you multiply this 11th day by the third month, it comes to 22 day, sixth month, and 22 six is 622. Okay, so they 
this is one of the, I try to avoid that one, okay. I just go with the fact that June 22nd is, it was Pentecost in Millerite history and therefore it becomes a symbol in our history because we see June 22nd pop up in our history. When did we get the money for this school? June 22nd. Three years later we have the first presentation on the midnight cry here on when did that camp meeting begin? June 22nd. Okay, so um, I got to, I don't got to, but I want to move through this a little bit quicker than I'm doing, okay? Page three of your notes. Now, on the bottom of page three, you'll see the statement by the Adventist Church, if you want to read that for yourself. Um, and uh, here, June 22nd. All right, so. All right, I guess I've, I've put those things in place. Next page, page four. Yes. On those two, two end chiastic structures there. This, this one, one and, and this that one. one. Okay. This, on the three, each three, can those be designated as uh, third, sixth, and ninth hour? The 63 be the third and sixth hour? I'm saying like 2018, the first one, June, what is that, June 9th? Yep. 2018, would that be like third, sixth hour, and then sixth, and then ninth, and then the other? The other I would the other say end? you'd have to say August, I don't know. I haven't thought that through, but August 11th would line up with the third hour. August 11th would line up with 9-11. And one more question, which kind of would be a side issue. Can we take the 63 and make it at 36? I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, does that, I don't think so, but maybe. This isn't, this isn't a calendar reference. This is a, a numerical reference, right? This is half of 126, which is half of 252, which is whatever it is of 1260 and 252, 2520. This is more numerical, where, the, where we rever reverse some of the dates are with the European and, and American calendar dates. I don't know. I don't, I don't know that. I'm not the one to answer that. Page four. <laughs> March 27th is a symbol to the Levites. Um, and it connects here. Uh, 1,533 weeks with the begin beginning of the message on November 9th, and it's tied together with this on, on the 1,533. We've already went over that. Um, and from here to here, this whole chiastic structure from here to here is 731 days, which is what? It's July 31st, which in the Julian is July 18th, saying that the message for these people is July 18th. Um, okay, Paneum proclaimed January 14th, 1533 days. Okay, I'm, I'm referenced this, 7 and 21. The 100 days of prayer ends on what? July 4th. July 4th. Okay. And f from July 4th, inclusively, if you go 7 days, takes you to July 10th. This is inclusive. And 21 days takes you to July 31st. So what I want you to see is down here at the beginning, not the beginning of the chiastic structure, but in the beginning of this 1533, the beginning of this history, you've got this 721 phenomenon. This one ends with the presentation on Paneum. This one ends 
with July 18th. July 31st in the Julian is July 18th. Um, okay, just showing these. And these three way marks then. These three way marks. Um, July 10th is the Day of Atonement. July 31st. July 18th is the 26th day of the fourth month. And July 31st is the 10th day of the fifth month. So these waymarks possess in them three biblical symbols. Day of Atonement, yes? The 31st is both. Oh, yeah. okay. It's both, because the 31st is, is representing the 31st and July 18th. It's the 26th day of the 4th month and the 10th day of the, seven, of the 5th month as July 31st. Okay. Now, back to here. To here. On March 26th, the second to the last presentation in this school before we went into retirement was the shut door. The, this, the one after that, now July 27th, March 27th was the shut door, the 28th was 1863. Okay. The door is now getting closed. And the reason it's getting closed is because of 1863. Okay, the, this history here is the, is the message to Adventism, final call to Adventism. And in every generation there is a shut door message. This is old, old line of reasoning with us, right? Yes. You okay, Kathy? You with me? Every message, beginning with Noah, there's a shut door message in every generation. Is that chart on our paper? No, this is, yeah, there's part of it, but not all of it. But on page five is the notes for this. In every generation, there's a shut door message, and Adventism has rejected this shut door message. Where did their rejection begin? 1863. So, so on March 27, 2019, this chiastic structure is for Adventism, and the voice that has been calling to them is going to go into retirement for five months. You follow me? Right here. This is, the, this, is this chiastic structure. March 27th, March 27th, March 27th. This is the chiastic structure for Adventism. The center way mark defines what it's for. This is where Adventism goes into a hundred days of prayer because of this pandemic. So this has to be about Adventism. Every generation has a shut door message. What was the shut door message for Adventism? It was Daniel 11, 40 to 45. The warning message that this ministry gave from the very beginning was that at the Sunday law, your probation closes. They had a shut door message given to them. But... They could not receive it. Why could they not receive it? Because they had rejected the foundations. When did they reject the foundations? 1863. So the last two presentations that took place in this room in March 27th and March 28th of 2019 was the Lord saying, you've had your warning message. Okay, now that message is going silent. Did the message go silent for ancient Israel? Yeah, there, there, there comes a time where it gets shut down. Your house is left unto you. Okay, so this is speaking to Adventism. Okay, that, that we still have a camp meeting to do here where we're going to retire. But this is the end in this school, the school of the prophets. This is about Adventism. This has to be about Adventism as well. Um, retirement took place, retirement camp meeting took place from March 31st to April 7th, 
April 7th to September 7th. What's September 7th? Right here. This is the chiastic structure of midnight. This is the chiastic structure of midnight. And from April 7th, when we go into retirement, to September 7th is what? It's 150 days. Right? It's 100. Uh, what's going on here? A hiding. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a hiding going on in this history. You have 144 days. Uh, yeah, I do. But yeah, I do, but not for that. Oh, okay. Do I? Read it all. No, I'm April 7th to August 29th. All right, here you go over here. Okay, so what was... March, March 27th, 327, 2019, to September 7th, 2019. 19 is how many days? 150. 150 is a symbol of hiding. Okay, now what you're seeing is, is that from March 27 to August 29th. What's August 29th? When the April was. August 29th. In this history here of August 29th, 9th, 7th, they're having their camp meeting in Germany. They're having their camp meeting in Germany. This is where the Omega movement tells the women, you either put on pants or you receive the mark of the beast. This is where the Omega movement identifies that their visual test is underway. So from August 29th to, to September 7th is how many days? 10 days. So 10 day testing period leading to here. Okay, that's what the August 29th is on there for. How many days between September or March 27th and August 29th? 144 days. Okay, now to the connection that I want to start using to segue here. August 29th, 2019 is 220 years since the Pope died in captivity in 1799 on August 29th. 1799? Okay. He was, when was the, the deadly wound delivered? Okay, so we're beginning to segue, and I'm now I'm about ready to give the overview of where I hope to go in the following presentations as we break out of the chronology for a while. But I want you, I want to remind you something here. This history here, this is where popery is restored in this movement. And I'm saying October 13th is a symbol of the counterfeit. And that this chiastic structure from here to here is the omega chiastic structure. Beginning on October 13th, 2018, going to March 27th, 2019, and to September 7, 2019. This chiastic structure is about the rebellion of the Omega movement. Okay, and their rebellion is pretty complex. But part of it is, is when you get down here to September 7th, by August 29th, 10 days before that, they're, the group that's with them in Germany are being tested over this false Lateran message. That's what the 10 days are for. And then at 9-7, we come out of hiding and begin to expose these things as we enter into this history where the Lord is opening these things up to us. So in your notes, it says, Pope Pius VI was born when? December 25th. December 25th. 
What's December 25th? It's a symbol of the dragon. Okay, December 25th, 1717. 1717, there's a doubling for you. And he dies the 29th of August, 1799. Born Count Giovanni Angelo Braschi was the head of the Roman Catholic Church and ruler of the Papal States from the 15th of February, 1775 to his death in 1799. Pius VI condemned the French Revolution and the suppression of the Gallican Church that resulted from it. French troops commanded by Napoleon defeated the papal troops and occupied the papal states in 1796 and 1798. Upon his refusal to renounce his temporal power, Pius was taken prisoner and transported to France. He died one year later and in Valence. He reigned over two his reign of over two decades is the fourth longest in papal history. August 29, 1799 to August 29, 2019 is 220 years. And that's when PNT enforced papal kingly power upon Stephen and Odilio, saying, renounce uh, this chronology or be, what do they call it when they kick you out of the church? Anathema. Uh, Anathema. Excommunicated from their Jesuit movement. Okay, so let me check these dates. <coughs> All right, you can see the structure up here of, that I'm talking about. I'm saying this is the Omega structure. You can see, I've already given you the, the logic of it. So move to me. Now I'm going to introduce you to where I'm going to go now in Daniel's last vision. We've talked a little bit about the King of the South, a little bit about the false prophet Trump, the Constitution, and a little bit about the internal. I want to switch to Fatima. When was the miracle of Fatima? October 13th. It was on October 13th. 1917. October 13th, 1917. You see anything about October 13th? October 13th is a very important day for the papacy. So I have here for you, just, this wasn't anything special, I just googled it. This is a printout about Fatima, if you're not familiar with it. Please read it before our presentations tomorrow. This is Catholic nonsense, okay? So I'm not saying that this is, this is accurate, but this is what's guiding Catholicism. It tells you about Fatima. Please notice on page 9 in this Fatima article that I'm asking you to read before we come back into this subject. The location of Fatima in Portugal is the same place that PNT's primary European ministry is located. In fact, if you were strong enough, you can walk from Finn in Portugal to the Fatima camp. It's that close. Okay, they might argue that, that they have a bigger group of people in France than they do in Portugal, and in numbers, that's true. But the French people, they haven't ever supplied any funds to anything. They're, they're totally dependent on outside sources, whereas the ministry in Portugal was, has always been a functioning ministry, has its own equipment, its own funds. The stronghold for PNT in France is Portugal, and it's right where the Fatima monument is at. In fact, when you go there, if you have time, they will always try to get you to go visit Fatima. Jeff. Yes. Also, August 29th was the baptism. Okay. Uh, yeah, some of this is old news I've, I'm putting that place. This is where they were to be baptized, put on pants. This is where... So what are you saying? I'm what? saying that that's where they were, um, in one way, christened as their new movement. They okay. christened their movement. Okay. Everyone got that. So... Um... I, in some of the in, in some of this overview, as you read down, I'm on page ten now, just glancing down. I'm I'm height, I'm emphasizing October thirteenth. Now, if you don't remember, test was test was used in this room on October third to put November 9th in place. But what she taught about November 9th was satanic error. But November 9th is a valid waymark. It's not until October 13th 
that you get a second witness for November 9th through the chronology, and it is airtight. But what it does is November 9th, uh, uh, when you confirm November 9th on October 13th, then you see something very profound. You see that from November 9th, 2019, unto October 13, 2019. I've got October 13, 2019 in the wrong place here. Okay, this has got to be... Can I ask you a question, Jeff? Yeah, in one minute. i got to get this straight. October... Yes. Yes. October 13, 2018. Yes, 2018. Okay, so... October 13th, 2018, preceded by October 3rd, 2018. Here's where we get the second confirmation. This, I'm saying, is the Omega Chiasm, and that this is March 27th, 2018. And I'm wanting you to see as we go down through this that this date, October 13th, is a symbol of not just Catholicism, but Jesuit Catholicism. Okay, I want you to see that this date in our history is part of warning us about the Omega Movement. Okay, let me proceed down through these, this history here. Now on page 11, if you're not familiar with this, you got a picture of Lucia de Jesus Santos. She's one of three children that began to have visitations by the Virgin Mary and Joseph, Joseph and Jesus on May 13th, 1917. Six visitations. The, se the sixth was the miracle of Fatima. The miracle of Fatima took place on October 13th. And these three children supposedly got three secrets. Uh, they brought the, th the three secrets out into history fairly quickly, but the third secret was kept secret until the 1960s. And then there's been much conjecture over what the third secret represented. It represented it had about three parts. So I have just a little breakdown on page 11. It tells you about the second secret of Fatima briefly. That's not the one that there's controversy over. And then on page 12, you have the third secret of Fatima. There's a controversy in Catholicism about this third secret. What's the controversy? Well, the controversy is about, is the third secret strictly about the political struggle in the Catholic Church between the black pope and the white pope, between the good pope and the bad pope? And also, does it include this crisis at the end of the world? And if it includes the crisis at the end of the world, does it have to do with one line in Catholicism that says the crisis is brought about, now listen to me, by a meteor striking the earth? Well, that's one interpretation of the Fatima prophecy. The other interpretation of the Fatima prophecy is about a nuclear attack. Oh, there's a, there's a controversy in the story of Fatima in Catholicism. And when it comes to this third secret, some people interpret it that the crisis is brought about by a meteor hit in the earth, and the others say, no, it's a nuclear attack. Hmm. You getting anything here? Mm -hmm. All right, P&T will teach you that if they're going to address the Nashville problem that is created by Ellen White's writings, that it's either incorrect because she's a fallible person, she was a failed prophet, or that it is a meteor. Okay? What some other groups are teaching. It's what are the other groups that teach that, whether they're Catholic or apostate Protestantism, are using the Catholic technique called futurism. Yeah, but I mean, there's Adventists that used to be part of this movement, or there's Adventists, and they're saying the same thing. Okay, so I, that's what I want you to see, is out in the Catholic world, when it comes to the third secret of Fatima, there's some kind of crisis that hits at the end. And one claims, hey, it's a meteor. And the other one says, no, it's nuclear. Okay? And you can read just a little bit about that. But now, on 
page 13, and by the way, page 13, where it says, Infallible Catholic, this is a title of a Catholic magazine. I didn't search for this, I just Googled. Did you know, do you know, right? You knew this, because we put it in the public record here, that when the United States bombed Hiroshima, you know that there was a Seventh-day Adventist church there, right there at ground zero, and none of the members got hurt? You know that story, right? Mm -hmm. Did you know that there was also a Catholic church at ground zero, and none of them got hurt? Oh. Did you know that? Not really a Catholic church. It was a Catholic church. But it was a Jesuit order. Okay, so Infallible Catholic is giving you the history of Hiroshima. And it tells you about the eight Jesuits that were there at Grand Zero in their two-story building right here. And they weren't phased. They weren't what? Nothing happened to them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah but read through it. Okay, read through it. Eight German Jesuit priests who were all found unscathed with only a few minor injuries. And this is a picture of one of them uh, giving his testimony in, I don't know, thir 33 years later, I guess. Or he, was, he, was, he lived another 33 years, it says. You can read through that. What's my point? If you get to page 17... Uh, I, when, you, when this article concludes on the top of page 17, it says the Fatima miracle that occurred at Hiroshima is well known and well documented. It has been published in various journals since the war and can be read today on several websites. What, what do they call it? Yeah. The Fatima miracle. Okay, they're assigning this miracle of Hiroshima that preserve these eight Jesuit priests as the Fatima miracle. And then you have Japan, Hiroshima Remembered, from the Adventist News Network. What's that about? That's about the Adventist church in Hiroshima that also survived. There was 20 that survived unscathed. Wow, really? What does that mean? On page 18, still segueing into the following presentations, but closing this out. You have a picture there of an Adventist sister that survived the blast of Hiroshima. That's at the conclusion of the article. And then there's just a little tidbit about the, another stronghold for PNT. You see, this is about Fatima. When it comes to the beast, the storyline of the kingdom of the beast in Daniel 11 is based upon Fatima. And the stronghold in the, in the European world for Fatima is Fatima, Portugal. Which is right where PNT's stronghold is at. But the stronghold for Catholicism on this side of planet Earth is also happens to be where the stronghold for PNT is in the country called Brazil. It says, the Catholic Church in Brazil is part of the worldwide Catholic Church under the spiritual leadership of the Pope in Rome and the influential National Conference of Bishops of Brazil. Composed of over 400 primary and auxiliary bishops and archbishops, there's over 250 di dioceses, both of the Latin and Eastern Rites and other territorial jurisdictions in Brazil. The primate of Brazil is Dom, Muriel, Ramos, Krager. The Catholic Church is the largest domination in the country where 123 million people, or 64.6% .6 of the Brazilian population, are self-declared Catholics. These figures make Brazil the single country with the largest Catholic community in the world. The largest Catholic community in the world is in Brazil. On the, in the Western world, Brazil is the capital of Catholicism. And in Europe, Fatima, Portugal is the capital of Catholicism. Is it just a coincidence that the two strongholds of PNT is Portugal and Brazil, with one exception. And it was in, it was in Brother Daniel's sermon today. They got some strength in France. 
in atheistic France, too. Yes, my brother. And it's not a coincidence that when Tess was here and she presented her November 9th thing, she started with Fatima. That's where she started. And it drew our, and it even had you because you thought, oh, that's where I started. But I couldn't figure out why she was teaching it wrong. Yes, so. Yeah, it's, it's about Fatima. Did you know that there was Jesuits that were saved at Hiroshima and they call it the Fatima miracle? In contrast with Adventists that were saved at Hiroshima. The battle is real. Pardon me? The battle. the battle is real. And October 13th is the symbol of Fatima. And it's, it's this omega chiasm that's speaking to this fourth generation of this movement where these people actually become Catholic as instructed by their leaders. Yes. Yes. Can't hear you. Um, okay. Uh, no, I just want to bring something. Uh, I, do some more I did some more digging this morning, found some interesting things. Uh, we know that October 13 in the year uh, 977, it's a symbol of the false midnight cry in the story of Jeroboam. Uh, so I want to put that uh, on, in the record. But also interesting that I, I Did, found out that... Um, wait a second. First Kings... Uh, you're, you're saying first, that... First Kings 12. Verses 32 and 33. Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month. And you're saying that in 977, that was October 13th? Yeah, according to uh, Odilio's uh, yeah. line and Theodore's No, I, I agree with you. I know that too. I'm just making sure we're being clear on that to nail it down. Go ahead. So, the, and the 15th day of the 8th month, it's a symbol of August 15, which is the midnight cry, right? Right. But we know that that feast was not ordained by God, so it's symbolizing the false midnight cry which took place in October 13, 2018, in, in our line. Hmm. Right. Another interesting thing... As, as uh, is marked here. I found out... Go ahead. Come on. Right. And then, I, Theodore calculated from October 13th to uh, November 9th, 391.5 days. We uh, for that history, but we also know that in the story of Jeroboam, from 977, there's 391.5 years till the day. Uh, You're breaking up. In that. You're breaking up. Can you hear me now? Yep. So in the year 977. There is 391 years point for 391.5 years from 977 to the destruction of Jerusalem, which is July 18th on, on, on that line, on the prophecy of Ezekiel. Tenth day of the fifth month. Right. Another thing I want to mention is that. Um, the prophecy of Fatima, the, the, the miracle of the sun, took place on the year 1917, which was a, day, a year before the pandemic, the flu pandemic on 1918. So we have a pandemic one year after the miracle of the sun. So if you look at our line in October 13, we have a pandemic one year after the false midnight cry, which is typified by the miracle of the sun. Yeah, and... Does that make sense? Yeah, and, uh, and up here at 9-7, which is 977, right? 9 times 7 is 63, and 1917... If you multiply that, it's the same thing. Mm. 1 times 9 is 9, times 1 is 9, times 7 is 63. All kinds of little numerical 
phenomenons. The yeah. Yes. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Parminder told me, is their hero in the United States today. She's a young senator, one of the youngest senators, I think, ever nominated. She was born on October 13, 1989. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, she's the real radical one. She's the radical one, and she's who they claim in the United States as their mouthpiece. Okay, so what I've done is segued from these lines, hopefully you followed that, into the story of Fatima and the beast. There can't be a coincidence of the nuclear bomb in Hiroshima, Catholicism calling it the Fatima miracle, and that there was Seventh-day Adventists that were miraculously healed at the same point in time. Nor can it be a coincidence that in the political argument that has went on in Catholicism over Fatima, that one class of Catholics say that this crisis at the end is caused by a meteor and the other class says it's caused by a nuclear blast. Brother Jeff. Yes. One more thing. So during the pandemic of 1918, the two shepherds, the two young shepherds, they died right on that because of that pandemic. They died of the flu. So, the first one is called Jacinta, which comes from the word Yacint, which is basically a purple flower that is poison. Now, we all know that purple is a symbol of the papacy in the Bible. So, I found that very interesting. Her brother, it's named Francisco, which comes from the word Frank, or Frank man, which comes from the the Francos or the France. So it's a symbol of France, which is a symbol of the dragon. So right there, the two brothers, one is symbolizing the beast, and the other is symbolized by the dragon, and they die because of the pandemic. Right up. And Lucia? And then Lucia, she lives all the way through 2005. I believe she dies at 2005. And, and what's the root word of Lucia? It's light. Lucifer. Oh, oh there you go. The she, light here. she lives on. She lives on. She was their false prophet. Jeff. Yes. His Yacinda and what was the other guy's name? Franco. Franco. Okay, well, their last name is Marto, and that comes from Mars. That means they are the sons of Mars. And so we have that mentioned in the Bible, correct? Mars Hill. Well, it, in any case, it's a, it's a pagan god. Mars is a pagan god. I don't know what that means. But Paul went to Mars Hill, tried to reason with him. Were they the brothers and sister? Is that right? No, it was a hill. It was a hill in Greece. No, were the Yacinta yeah, Yacinta they were, they were brother, brother, brother and sister. Okay. Yeah. okay, that's the same two that I'm thinking of. Okay. So I, I don't think there is a coincidence that we have a pandemic one year after 2018, October 13, because we know we all know it's COVID-19. So it's, it happened one year after, just like in the story of Fatima. That's what the 19 is for, is for the year? I thought it was for the president. That's, that's correct. <laughs> no, no, I, okay, that's interesting. Well, let's bring it to a close. Heavenly Father, we are on the verge of a tremendous crisis, and we are thankful that you are opening up truth so we can understand our role, our message, and the seriousness of what's taking place. Uh, we've, particularly with these numbers, um, have a lot to internalize. We ask that you grant us the infilling of the Holy Spirit that these truths can settle in in a life-changing way, in a way that would better prepare us to share this message as probation is closing. Thank you for this Sabbath. Thank you for the light that you shared throughout this day. In Jesus' name, amen.